Yeah, so welcome everyone for the celebration event of uh, the 25th SPLC and for our panel on past, present and future of the software product line and software product line conference. Um, we have or plan to have actually six uh, panelists or actually five because I'm only supposed to be moderator and the three main uh, or three panelists are Linda Northrop, Kyok Young, and Frank van der Linden, who initially created SPLC, so to speak. Uh, we're still waiting for Frank and hope to join him. <laughs> there are some technical trouble on the way. Um, ah, Frank, hi. <laughs> Great that you can make it. And yeah. we also have Sarah Nadi and David Benavides on the panel and of course we will have you our dear audience for a lot of questions and discussions and input and so on so this is our celebration event i included a bit of fireworks usually i think mohammed would have liked to give us it live but now we are online that's all we can do so um if you ever looked at this website, the history of software product line conferences, then you may have noticed something peculiar because if you look at the full history, there are some strange names here in the beginning uh, of the SPLC history, which we today count as 25. And if you look at it, the first SPLC ever was 20 years ago. So how come we are celebrating the 25th SPLC right now? It's because we count all of that. And that has to do with the checkered history of where SPLC is coming from. And it actually wasn't until 2005 that there was the series of SPLC conferences. And that basically was when Frank, Linda, and Kyo came on stage and, and told us they are uniting forces across the two, three continents of Americas, of the Europe and of Asia. And I will never forget this moment because that was when the whole community came together to have one single event and have that as a continuous international collaboration. And we are still benefiting from that today. And that is, so to speak, the backdrop of what we are celebrating is also the backdrop of the panel. And because of that, I asked in particular uh, Kyo, Linda and Frank to give a bit of an introduction, a bit of a, a thoughts also uh, about the history and their personal view from the past as a starting point for this panel. Because I imagine I see a lot of young people around and that means they don't know about all of that. And so let's get a head start by jumping into the history and that uh, coming from the three people who basically started it. So I think Kyo is going to start, then I will stop my screen share for the moment. Okay. So we should now be able to take over screen okay. share and start with your phone. Okay, my name is Kyo Kang. Uh, I'm uh, retired from uh, University uh, of S uh, Science and Technology in Pohang, Korea. Uh, so I'm just, you know, Professor Emeritus uh, at, of the university. Let me briefly give, uh, introduce myself. I started my uh, software engineering career at the University of uh, Michigan long time ago, uh, 75. And my research was on requirement engineering. Uh, Meta modeling was my topic, uh, PhD topic. So uh, I did a lot of modeling uh, background. And then I moved to Belco and Bell Labs where I started research on software reuse uh, because uh, at the time uh, I moved to actually in 84 to uh, Belco and Bell Lab. And at that time there was a lot of interest uh, among uh, uh, 
industries on software use. And then uh, I moved to SCI uh, in, in 1986, uh, continue my research on software use and develop uh, FODA uh, there, feature-oriented uh, domain analysis method. Uh, nine, uh, 92, I moved to Postec in Korea. Uh, again, continued my research uh, on uh, product line engineering. Uh, 2013, uh, I retired from the university and joined the Samsung Electronics, basically to introduce uh, software product line technology to industry. I, wanted to have, uh, you know, uh, real, real world experience on how applying this, uh, how this software technology, uh, product line technologies can be applied to uh, industry. With that uh, short introduction, I'd like to give you an overview of how uh, use concept uh, evolved to uh, product line engineering. Okay? So if you uh, look at left column, uh, actually uh, from early 70s, actually from uh, 60s and 70s, uh, there were a lot of interest in code reuse. Okay? Uh, and uh, research communities start looking into uh, developing uh, software uh, repositories, basically code repositories from which uh, people, uh, developers can uh, search and download code they can use. But most of those uh, uh, attempt was not successful because they found out that many of the code in the repository are not uh, reusable. That means uh, they need to have a lot of uh, rework in order to be able to uh, reuse those code. So uh, there were a lot of researches, but uh, uh, really uh, nothing came out of those uh, that really can make big impact to industry. Uh, but if you look at 70s, interestingly, uh, there were only uh, uh, visionaries on software reuse who developed the, uh, various concept, which later led to software product line engineering. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, in 76, uh, the Dilemma and Crohn, who were at uh, Queen's University in Canada, developed something called module interconnection uh, language. Their uh, idea was that, uh, as, uh, programming in the large should be different from programming in the small. Okay? Uh, programming in the large, uh, we need to focus more on designing rather than coding. So they developed this idea of a mod mod module interconnection lang uh, language where design component can be in uh, implemented and integrated into uh, applications. Yeah? So that was very early uh, sort of visionary work. Yeah? And then uh, uh, 70, uh, 68 at the uh, NATO conference, uh, Doug McElroy uh, of Bell Labs uh, proposed that uh, we need to pro uh, produce a mass, uh, massively those uh, software component that can be reused. Yeah, so it is uh, sort of conceptual thinking, but uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, all, as early as uh, 68. Uh, in 1976, David Panas uh, published a uh, paper on program families. Uh, it is basically based on his earlier paper on information hiding. He extended that concept and uh, came up with the idea of a program families. So 
uh, he said that uh, we need to think about program families when we develop systems. Around the same time, uh, Yoshihiro Matsumoto at uh, Toshiba company, uh, he developed a really uh, product line idea. He was working on power plant uh, control systems and he saw that uh, he, uh, they were developing similar systems over and over again. So he came up with this, uh, uh, he called software factories, but that's uh, essentially product line idea. But uh, that there was no uh, follow up work of uh, his idea, uh, mainly because he focused on process, not uh, technology that can be re uh, used by others. So, but it's very early work. I invited him when he held uh, SPLC in, I think it was 2007. Uh, we held that uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. So I invited him as a keynote uh, speaker and he, uh, he introduced his idea at the conference. Anyhow, uh, this uh, code reuse idea evolved into design reuse and then design patterns uh, and software architectures. And uh, as you know, in the 90s, there were a lot of papers on architecture, software architectures, as architecture description languages and so on. And uh, there were also component-based software engineering. Uh, and I believe there were conferences. I don't know if it still continues. But all those ideas basically evolved into product line. Uh, before that, actually Jim Neighbor, he was a student at UC Irvine. And he uh, is, in my view, the first person uh, who introduced domain analysis, domain engineering uh, concept uh, in the software engineering. Uh, so we used uh, this domain analysis the terminology uh, in our work when we uh, worked on FODA, feature-oriented domain analysis method. So that's very brief uh, introduction of how code reuse concept evolved into product line engineering. So uh, basically, uh, you know, early on, we tried to do software engineering with reuse, but uh, it was not really productive because uh, of the re rework we had to do. So we uh, thought that we need to do software engineering for reuse before software engineering reuse, uh, software engineering with reuse can happen. So uh, there were some uh, effort to do cross domain use, but that was uh, very difficult because, uh, you know, limitation was not uh, uh, clear, boundary was not clear. So, uh, domain specific uh, use, which is basically product line engineering, uh, was, was born. Uh, so, this is the technical report we uh, did. did we uh, published it in 1990 at SEI, which I believe uh, made a big impact in product line engineering. Uh, I look back, why it was it so success successful? Because uh, it essentially codified most critical information for uh, developing reusable component, which is understanding commonality and variability. Yeah? So, uh, and also based on that commonality and variability information, we can create variation point and variance uh, when we develop uh, a reusable component. Uh, another point is simplicity. It's very uh, intuitive uh, uh, and simple. So uh, essentially anyone can understand what a feature model uh, represent. Practicality and applicability is another one. So I guess this is the point I can start. How, 
Do I have more time, Klaus? I think I used up my slot, so I start my- you're muted in case yeah. you're- I, I think uh, we should move now to, to Frank. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Frank, do you also have slides or? I don't have slides, so uh, just okay. uh, get my screen somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, <laughs> can you can you clear my, my I cannot somehow- uh, Stop the screen share? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, good. Okay, good. good. <laughs> yes. So let me start then now. So uh, the put of my glasses, I think it's better to do it this way. I still can see you without. Uh, so the only reading glasses, I have to sit a little bit to the back. Okay. Uh, uh, so I am still working at Philips. So uh, next January I will retire. So then I have almost 38 years at Philips uh, behind me. Uh, and uh, my uh, start product line started in about 1990 when I was involved with the uh, telecom division of Philips that served niche markets. And therefore they needed to deal with variability and they developed their own architecture. Their, even their own operating system, but that's uh, not, not really relevant. And uh, also their own methods. And th these methods was really planning, planning for diversity because that was necessary. And the main ingredients were components, uh, not named this way, by the way, uh, aspect-oriented development, not named this, name, this way because the name came later. Uh, same for components, by the way. Uh, they used uh, plug-in components, also not named this way. Uh, they used uh, callback interfaces, also not named this way. Uh, and uh, But this was all necessary for them to really realize very fast uh, uh, variants of their uh, te telecom switch. Uh, and so this aspect was also necessary for all kinds of quality uh, issues that, uh, that they uh, dealt with. So we took this, uh, these ideas over and we wanted to transform them into for use for our TV set development. So uh, it took us several years and, and a lot of these ideas also uh, were used in the end by our TC's VC TV set development. In about 1995, uh, we get in contact with Nokia and also uh, ABB was, was there. There were three main companies and three universities in Europe getting funding from the European uh, Commission to get uh, a project on software product families, it was called that way, that time, uh, mainly on the architecture parts. And, and, and this was relevant for our TV set de the department. So we worked on that. Uh, within this uh, project, we organized two uh, uh, workshops, the first one in 1996. Uh, where about 20 people uh, at the workshop, only those who uh, submitted the paper and were accepted were there. So there I met Linda for the first time, for instance. Uh, so, uh, and in 1998, we repeated it. So uh, the first time was in Spain. The second time was also in Spain, but then on one of the Canary Islands. Uh, and after uh, this first European project, we, we endeavored in a, in a larger set of projects, so three uh, two-year projects in the, in the ITEA framework uh, with uh, many companies in Europe, many universities, many in institutes, and we started to do so. We continue our workshops every second year, but in the meantime also uh, in uh, Linda has organized her, her SPLC, so at a certain moment we decided we should merge. So the last one organized by the project was called SPLC Europe, and so after that, it was only SPLC what was left over. So uh, I'm very glad that it was there and I'm still very happy that, that I did so because I still think software product line engineering is the essence of good software engineering. And also I see, I see it also in Philips. So uh, I moved in the meantime to the Philips uh, healthcare business, which is the only one that's left over now. Uh, they still have the architecture started in 1996 and 97, 
uh, still have the same architecture, although it evolved over time because of all kinds of new things came in from outside world and all were accommodated, but they're still have uh, the same principle there and, and it, it is very relevant that they keep it this way. So this is what I think, uh, and that's the future of SPLC. SPLC is really the core of good software engineering. So that's also a message for all of you in the uh, in the room, in your own room probably, but uh, yeah, so uh, go further with it because it's important. So that's my main message. Thanks. I'm, I'm sure many people in here are very yeah. happy to hear that. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. So, uh, Linda. Hi, I'm Linda Northrop. <clears throat> I'm a technical fellow at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute, which is basically an applied research lab attached to the DOD. The mission is to improve the state of the practice of software engineering, of cybersecurity, and most recently, artificial intelligence engineering. I joined the SEI in 1992, and I came from a background in object technology, and that was what my research was. So I loved Keo's slide with the history of reuse because I was there with the object technology, and we were doing reuse then and, and thought it was wonderful. Um, after a couple of years, I was selected to lead the software architecture project at the SEI. And then in, at about that time, let me just paint the landscape of what the SEI was doing. There was a big effort in process improvement. So if you've ever heard of the capability maturity model, that was a big part of the SEI. I wasn't in that part. I was in the technology part and we were interested in real-time systems. And then the domain analysis work that Keo talked about, and by the way, that technical report that Keo and SEI colleagues wrote is still one of the most cited SEI technical reports of all time. Also, we were doing software architecture, um, re-engineering, and then there was this little group of people called the Computer Emergency Response Team which evolved into CERT and became the cybersecurity, the biggest arm of the, the Software Engineering Institute. In 1995, I was selected to be a technical program director. And as part of the software architecture agenda, um, <clears throat> a team of two people went to visit a company in Sweden called Celsius Tech. And they came back with its great story about Celsius Tech and how they had done a product line and how that had given them tremendous benefits, business benefits. And we got quite excited about that. It was at the same time we were thinking about the domain analysis work, where was that going to go? And there was an initiative in the DOD called the STARS Initiative, which was also about reuse. So, I put together a team and we developed a proposal and I successfully pitched a proposal for the DOD to fund what we call the product line practice initiative. And the goal was to make software product lines a low risk, high return proposition for all organizations. Because what we saw is it was high return for Celsius Tech, but it certainly wasn't low risk. And we saw some of the other reuse efforts that Kiu talked about is not really being very high return, but involved a lot of effort. So we started holding some workshops and we invited representatives from organizations who were succeeding with software product lines, like Celsius Tech, like Philips, um, Schlumberger, a number of others. And that was when we got connected with the movement on Europe called Product Family Engineering. Thank you, Frank. Blighted <laughs> us, us to your workshops. And for those of you who are back channeling, yes, lots of beer and wine involved in all of these meetings. <laughs> very much, very much enjoyed. So, yeah. so um, in this initiative and all these workshops, we developed our own focus. And what our discovery was, was that software product lines was not just a technical strategy. It was not just a technical reuse strategy. It was a business and technical strategy. And those business and technical strategies had to be married in order for it to be successful. 
So we talked about core asset development and product development and management at multiple levels. And important to us, and I still believe this, was the architecture-based development piece of this in the core asset development. But just as important on the business side was the scope in the business case. And that business case had to marry with the architecture and the variation that it provided. These are things that I still believe to be true. I worked with a wonderfully talented team at the SEI whose names line the annals of product line legacy. And over the time, say 1996 to 2008, we developed what we call the framework for product line practice. It was a reference model and it laid out all the necessary practices that one had to succeed with in order to actually get benefit out of a software product line approach. Um, we wrote a number of case studies. We wrote some product line practice patterns. We, everybody wanted, oh, SEI, make a maturity model. I didn't want a maturity model. So we made an adoption roadmap. We wrote a book with all of that stuff in. Um, we had a curriculum of five courses that we used to teach at organizations and online. And then we had a product line evaluation method called the product line technical probe. Over the course of all of this, we collaborated with researchers all over the world. Some of you are here and develop methods for a business case, the simple method for architecture development, for mining assets and all kinds of things. So that was kind of the history of the SEI and our involvement in product lines. But what about SPLC? So I said I came from the object community and in the object community, I was very much involved with the OOPSLA conferences. I don't know if anybody, um, can you show me if you have ever heard of OOPSLA? Um, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so I was very much involved in OOPSLA and I really loved this conference model which was more than the workshops we were going to when we were hosting. And I had this idea that there was a big enough appetite in the software product line community that we could have such a conference. Now, what I meant by this conference would be, you know, tutorials and workshops and a doctoral symposium and keynote speakers and a highly refereed technical program and industrial speakers and a panel we got this bright idea for the product line hall of fame and very important to me because remember i came from the upsil community was that we have social activities where there would be beer drinking and wine drinking and all kinds of opportunities for interaction and so was that in i i have no idea how i got approval from the dod for this but i did and in 2000 we had what we called the first international software product line conference in Denver. And we were so excited. We had over 100 people and people thought it was very successful. And then from the SEI's standpoint, we broke even. So <laughs> I didn't owe anybody any money. So that was, that was goodness. So we repeated it. And in 2002, we had it in San Diego and we started a steering committee. Um, with international representation and some people uh, here were on that steering committee. And then in 2004, it was in Boston. Now, remember that in between then, we were having workshops, uh, our colleagues in Europe were having workshops. There was a reuse conference that Kia was involved in. But in 2004, the steering committee got together and we said, you know what? we really need to unite under one conference mantle and we ought to continue this SPLC and we ought to make a pact that we will split the location among the Americas, and I didn't say North America, the Americas and Europe and Asia. And so it was. In 2005, I saw a number of you went to Ren. That was the first product line conference in Europe. And then in 2000, 
and six, we had it in Baltimore. I saw some Baltimore participants and so it went on. And I wanna thank you so much for carrying this legacy forward because I really think it's a very special community. Many of you are chatting about how inclusive it is, how fun it is and how much research we've actually accomplished. And we really have made a huge dent. In my humble opinion, and I'll stop here, is that product lines is still a viable and profitable approach. Although I believe that how we actually make that happen is changed because the technology has changed and because business models have changed. And I still feel very strongly that it is a business and technical strategy. So I'm gonna stop there and I can't wait to engage with the rest of the people at the conference. Thanks, Linda. Thanks very much for this. So um, let's move on and with the others on the panel for a brief introduction. Sarah, do you wanna go next? Uh, sure, yeah. So I'm um, Sarah Nettie. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. And I have to say, I started this way, way later than everybody who's talked uh, before me. So I started research on product lines in 2010 for my PhD. And I was mainly focused on um, extracting configuration constraints and ensuring consistency. So mainly things with the Linux kernel. Um, I now moved on to more variability in time. So looking at versions and how to um, look at things like forking and like reuse practices across forking. Um, so I think there's opportunities also in kind of modern software practices for um, software product lines and software reuse. Um, and yeah, I'm quite honored, honestly, to be among all of you, especially since probably all the names here were among my highest citations in my thesis. So it's kind of nice to be here. And thank you for the great history from all of you. Thanks, David. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this uh, wonderful panel, Klaus. I'm like nervous being uh, with Kyo Khan, one of my reference, Linda. I wrote, uh, I read the book on product lines when I was learning product lines, Frank Madden Linden, le uh, leading the projects, or the families project, uh, cafe projects and all the those projects at the beginning. So I, I don't want to add that much to the history, just say that um, when I graduated from my master, master thesis, uh, I knew nothing about product lines. And the first time I met the concept was in the families project there back in 2002 or something like that. And I said, oh, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. That was something that I was thinking when writing the, our student project, so the re reusability from one year to another, you know, when you are a student, you want to, to do these kind of things, to reuse the code of others to do better. And uh, um, this is one of the points I want to raise uh, and after uh, give the word to Klaus to see if we have some debate, is that I think we miss somehow uh, to have these core concepts of product lines inside the graduate, the undergraduate programs. We, we are still missing that because um, I think I, I teach now in, in the same program I, uh, I used to study and they don't know or they know very little about product lines after, after graduating. So, uh, but, but, the, but however, the problems are there. They, they face the, those problems when, when they will go outside in the practice. So we are missing something there. And this is something that we, we have to work a little bit more. Uh, we had those books there, but maybe to have some updated material to have, to have teaching material. And because the, I, I have seen also in this past some communities, related communities that more or less died, for example, aspect orientation and things like that. There are, well, there are some tools and so on, but, but not really fundamental. However, our community is still alive. Of course, we have some problems as all most of the software engineering conference, I would say, because everything is going to AI. Uh, but um, I think this is something we missed. I don't know if uh, someone wants to take the, the word on that or you, Klaus, want to 
ask other questions. Thank you. No, I think, uh, th thank you, David. This is really a very, very great question, given also that Frank just lauded SP, uh, software product lines as doing good product, uh, doing good software engineering. So uh, one could make the assumption that basically the crowning of every software engineering course is to t teach product line engineering, but it doesn't happen, as you say. That's correct. So I would just like to give this to the panel or to the floor, to, to all of you out there and the participants. What do you think? How should product line ideas, how should they be integrated in education? How can they perhaps also be integrated? Because there might be some preliminaries that you still need to teach. Linda, do I interpret it correctly? You want to say something? Yes, well, so touchy subject <laughs> because, uh, you know, as happened with you too, Klaus, and, and I don't know others, you know, we had initial funding to do wonderful things at the SEI. And then the view is, well, the community is already doing this now, so we need to move on and do something different. And I surely get that. But money to sustain and keep current the movement that's happening um, was not there. And though we tried to continue to do that, I retired from my full-time job in 2015. And I know SEI materials are still out on the website, but they're dated. I, I'd be the first to admit that. And I think what we really need to do is update the concepts with the modern blush of technology that we currently have, because I really see people doing product lines. And I get email from people who are saying, you know, we're really doing product lines. We don't call it that, but we could really use your insights on how this architecture should work and how we can get our organizations buy-in and so on. And those principles, um, though we may have overdone it with the framework, and I think Europe overdid it with BAPO, but it was the time of big models where we were trying to be comprehensive about writing everything down. But I do think there's an essence of things that have not changed. And there's so much new technology that we could bring to bear to make this even more profitable. I mean, I think about all of the various artificial intelligence techniques that could be used in partnering with product line variation and in partnering with um, how we roll product lines out. Uh, I just see there's a lot of research that could happen. Now, how it gets introduced into the university, I think is still problematic. And I think there are materials that are needed in people who have to want to do it. But I think from the business side, people get it and people are doing it. They might not want to call it that because they have to call it something different. They have to call it artificial intelligence for reuse or something, I don't know. So I'll let someone else speak. Can I? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I, I want, yes, mainly to, to add something to this. I think the, the most important thing, if you want, really want to do this, is to take this idea of David Parnas, programming in the large and programming in the small. Programming in the large means that you have concepts of your domain, your business domain, and these concepts are already reflected in, uh, in the software in one way or another, but it's not simple lines, it's, it's large pieces of software. And these things you want to compose. And software engineering is dealing with how to compose these big, big things in, in, into something that's useful for yourself. And especially also you, you deal with variability so that, that there are things that, that may vary and you have already prepared for it. So you interchange things and then you have something else that's also good, also robust, whatever you want. So I think this is important. That's also in the courses. It's not programming and writing if statements. It's, it's really combining large pieces of software. That is what software engineering is. And therefore you need to do first the, the, the small things before you can do the large things. Although a lot of things are happening already with uh, uh, pro programming environments and whatever that can help you already a lot in the in this this way, uh, making it easier uh, at at modern times. But uh, 
originally it uh, it was you have to do these two steps uh, before you can do this and so therefore it's late and if people want to make money with programming then they don't wait and they don't uh, think too much and just go programming yeah that was following my, on... my message <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, following on what uh, frank said uh, i think what uh, university teaches is still programming in the small but uh, I, uh, you know as frank said uh, we need to focus on design yeah? uh, because uh, you know many things are, are many softwares are becoming larger and also we are developing similar systems over and over again so programming in the large uh, we have to focus on designing and uh, you know developing similar systems uh, we have to uh, introduce this kind of uh, uh, product line technology concept yeah? so those are the uh, uh, things that university education should, should focus on designing uh, focusing on design and uh, teaching uh, engineering principles uh, supporting this, uh, you know, idea of say uh, information hiding program family uh, architecture and you know those things need to be incorporated into um, you know uh, education. Well, when I look at what's really happening, I mean, people are reusing big chunks of software. Uh, where does the typical software engineer go? They go to Google, they go to Slack, they go, they figure out mm -hmm. where the big chunks of code are that they can put together and they put them together and they create a lot of technical debt for themselves, but they get something done quickly. Um, in bigger organizations, that may not bode as well, but I I think there's a ton of reuse that's happening. And I think there's a ton of reuse that's happening in some pretty large chunks of software. But what I don't see as much is the idea that anyone really thinks about how those things are connecting, how those things could be varied over time and what in fact they could gain for the business. What's difficult at the university level is I, and this is my own bias, I'm sure, but I believe the product lines are a business and technical strategy. And unless you have that business context, it's hard for you to really get why all this is important because it really makes a difference when you're thinking about testing time and integration time and time to market and all the rest of those things, but that's not so important in the university. So, so I, I just wanted, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Sorry. You're done. Okay, no, I just wanted to pick up on a few things actually um, Linda said like that we don't call it that. So I think a lot of the concepts are actually being taught. So I don't think it's necessarily that we're missing a big gap. I think it's just maybe terminology. Plus, um, so we don't teach the business side at all, but um, I think from the technical side, there's also newer concepts that are integral, like um, deployment now. So basically all the DevOps movement, you're talking about how to pick bits and pieces and deploy different variants for different folks, right? So, so I think there are, a lot of these concepts in the teaching or in the curriculum um, for maybe more of senior level software engineering courses, we just don't label them as that. And um, I, I noticed this anyway, like just even talking to companies or to other people, I think the terminologies we use in the software product line community aren't common terminologies that people use. And so you realize, oh, you are doing kind of what I'm doing in my research or what I'm thinking of, but it's just different terminologies and it actually takes a long time to even reach kind of just common terminology that we can use to discuss things. Yeah, I, I see a point there that, that it's important because uh, us or most of us as researchers and academics are supposed to, to somehow um, build up a body of knowledge. So, so, so this gap between what people understand and what we are talking about 
is there and we are missing something to to bring that gap like uh, consolidating knowledge for example or things that are obvious for us but then we have to somehow do the effort of consolidating that knowledge to uh, make it easier to teach to our students and to uh, communicate with industrial partners because it's fine for us if we if we see their their problems or the problems that are outside and we identify and map those to our uh, let's say ontology uh, but then uh, they, they don't profit from our output. If we write a book or we, we write a paper or a report or something, they don't understand that much what we, we are saying. So there, I, I think we miss for the future path of the panel. <laughs> we miss somehow to, to, to consolidate our knowledge and make it more, more close to, the, to, to what the, the reality is. Yeah. Yep. So, so if I could just build on that, I think testing my understanding, you need for it to be more accessible and more relevant and more um, understandable in terms of people's current vocabulary. Exactly. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And thank you, Sarah, for picking up on that. I see a lot of what we talked about going on they're not calling it software product lines. But, but, but the part that always gets to me is that they miss some really important parts and then are rediscovering the wheel. And I wish somehow I could communicate as you're saying, David, just make that connection. Thanks. Yes, um, and, and for me, it is also a kind of mindset so you can do whatever you do in uh, development of systems in in the end your mindset is i want to manage variability independent in, in a certain way independent related to our business and that mindset you need to have and then you can see how things link to each other and if you miss this mindset uh, you, you 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 can still do the same things as, as linda said and also david but uh, uh, you, you missed the, the main idea that this is something special but very important and uh, uh, and, and and some and people not always see this right um some of you may know there was an effort also to do to to collect and integrate knowledge on teaching and even some teaching coursework. Um, I think uh, perhaps Rick, can, uh, who was involved with this initiative, what's your position on that? How do we integrate all of that in, in the real world? Do we have to reinvent this curriculum with new terminology? Because we just heard the terminology is, is part of the boundary or part of the problem. So thank you. Uh I mean, I did this together with Mathieu and Roberto a couple of years ago. Um, and we have a repository in which we collect the teaching material and stuff like that. And what we did, we analyzed how product line engineering is actually taught at different universities, right? And we have seen every co possible combination. We have seen uh, separate courses that only teach product lines, so full courses. We have seen being taught as part of model-driven engineering, as part of software engineering, as part of some programming course even. Um, mostly in graduate uh, uh, courses, not undergraduate. So there I have to agree with David, uh, or want to agree. Um, and maybe let me let me comment a little bit on, on, on the other uh, thing that has been discussed. Um, I think involving industry here is, is crucial because the point is, yeah, as Linda says, they have different terminology, but in the end, um, how you realize technically the variability, be it microservices, be it feature toggles, be it however you call the current uh, realization, be it in some cloud technology, that's one side. But the other side is that the variability as a concept and how you represent variability explicitly, that's something as soon as industry understands what they can, how they can benefit from that, you can start talking. But if you talk about product lines, they don't immediately understand that. So involving industry in your courses, give, having them give invited talks is one way. 
cooperation projects where you directly collaborate with them and explain them what you're doing is, is, diff is a different way. In any case, I think this is something that is really essential and not always easy, of course, and, and depending on the funding instruments you have and the ways of research you're doing. But yeah. So, so I have this idea. Um, I don't think that when you go to a company, you start out with software product lines and introduce it and talk to them about the solution. And I don't think when you teach students, you talk about software product lines and you start out with the solutions, but you start out with the problem. And what's the problem that the organization is having? And maybe for the students, a case study, here's an organization that's having this problem. What do you do about that problem? And then introduce techniques and put them together. And in the end, I don't really care if it's called software product line, but if they do the essence of strategic reuse with managed variation to achieve business goals, then they've got it. And if somehow in the process, they know how to architect a system and they know how to charge um, to choose variation mechanisms and they know how to instrument the tooling because Sarah's exactly right. We have a whole DevOps tool chain that we use now. And, and this is one of the things that I see um, is missing in the software product line community, or maybe it's there and I'm just not well enough read on it but how we insert ourselves along that tool chain and what we can do by way of using some data analytics and some maybe search-based engineering and so on to facilitate the variation and to facilitate the configuration management. So that's just a thought. I think this is a very interesting area uh, the connection to new technologies and tomorrow there's also the keynote on microservices as one example there was a workshop on on modern technologies and, and uh, uh, product lines um what i'm wondering is uh and, and that just i guess goes to the whole panel and to everybody will this be new ch uh, challenges or is this just applying what we know already abstractly just to a new application area meaning is it research i'm overemphasizing here a bit obviously is it research to do these new kind of technologies or is it basically engineering now my opinion is basically applying what we already know to to new fields mm. but uh yes so 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 you you still need to have the good right of mindset to be able to do so. I think so too. You know, it's basically the same principle of price. Uh, so it's basically the same thing, in my view. But that, I'm trying that, to think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That, that's research and engineering, or isn't it? But that's also research because there are new things in, 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 uh, involved. Sorry. Applying something to a new domain, it's somehow science in engineering, isn't it? Or are, are we all I mean... doing fundamental science? <laughs> so, so don't, don't, don't make this border too hard because it is. <laughs> Uh, from an academic perspective, I know there is a border and I know at the SEI we discriminate between projects that are real research projects and projects that are engineering projects. But when I look at the whole microservices world and the whole microservices community, I see the same problems that we saw in product lines. They're just using a different medium of technology. And, and once you grok the, that medium of technology, as Frank said, it's the basic concepts. You fit them into those basic concepts and you're off and running. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's engineering or research. <laughs> yeah, like without labeling whether it's engineering or research, I think it's, it's, it's applying a lot of what we know. There are some small like 
newer things like in microservices the whole idea of like fault tolerance you know if the service isn't working your backup is the service so maybe representing these kinds of things in your variability in a way like in your variability model but it's yeah. not like rocket science it's just a, a kind of a, a small detail you have to kind of take into account right so yeah. I mean, the, the, the one reason why I was asking this question is simply we didn't see a lot of these kind of papers in, in the last years, mm -hmm. despite all of these technology development. And I was wondering if somebody would write this paper and send it to SPLC, to the research track, what would be the likelihood that it would be rejected on being not innovative enough? Because that is, in my view, a, a general problem of a lot of research and academic conferences. That, that was the driving point behind this question. What do you so, think? So I'm just going to start. I, I, I would like to see such a paper just to make sure that we are, again, kind of bridging that gap in terminology, being relatable to newer technologies and so on. Um, but I think the main problem here is that finding um, meaningful subjects to study or to present this in um, is going to be hard because uh, at least that was always my challenge actually in the SPLC kind of world is finding um, this the whole these whole concepts and applying them in a meaningful way you really need an industry partner that has these business needs that you can drive it forward um, that's why the Linux kernel has been over over and over as a research subject because that's what we have um, so with microservices it might even get harder because you don't have a real application or a business partner that you can study this with um, so personally for me I find it interesting I would like to see such a paper it's just how do you find the right subject um, to study here. Yeah, I thought uh, looking at papers being presented at uh, SPLC recently, I felt it very strange that, uh, you know, uh, still many of the papers are focusing on feature modeling, feature analysis, and, you know, all those things. Uh, I think this view should evolve as computing platform changes and, uh, you know, the uh, system attitude like fault tolerance that Sarah just talked about, you know, those things, security and, you know, those aspects are becoming more important these days. So somehow this view should be integrated with uh, a feature, feature view of product line. And uh, if we do that, then there will be a lot of research that uh, can be generated. But still, many of you know researchers are still focusing on you know all the concepts like <laughs> feature modeling. Uh, because the concepts are easier to find subjects for. Yeah, I, I, I still think this is one of the biggest problems we face. Um, yeah. If you don't have the right connections in industry. And even when I had like my latest kind of industry related projects, I thought, you know, I'm going to go in and re-engineer their system and change this into a product line and, you know, what. And then like half the thing we thought about that we have from the literature just didn't apply. You need the more long-term kind of relationship three or four years to re-engineer their system to really kind of be inside and understand all the intricacies. So the applied part is actually much harder. It's, I'm not saying the theoretical part is easy, but you don't, there's less bottlenecks to get to it. Um, so yeah. But unfortunately I feel that the academic parts are less impactful. And I would agree with Keo. either I'm really old and that's definitely true. <laughs> or I just feel like I've read these papers or their increments on papers I read last year and the year before and the year before that. And I'm waiting. I want to be excited. I want to see something that's, that's a bit different take and use some of these new technology. I don't necessarily think it has to be an engineering approach. I may be naive here, but I do think there's some way that one can improve upon product line um, production using artificial intelligence. And I think that could be quite exciting. Uh, I, if 
I had your idea. What's that? I I agree with this idea. Thank you, Frank. We should turn back the clock, be 20 years younger, and work on it. <laughs> yes, okay. and that is research. And of course, applying AI is just doing software product line engineering, but applying it also for doing software product line engineering is double. And that's very good. Okay. So thank you all. Very great talk. And I would love to continue this for the next two hours, but then probably Mohamed will jump out from Britain right over the pond to me because we are running right into the next session. But it's 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 really a blast to, to talk with you. And I would really envision to do that for two more hours. And perhaps we can do it at one of the next conferences over beer, which was very often cited in, in the chats here. So this would really be great. It, it's a lot of fun to talk with you about all of these issues. And I actually have five more questions on my backlist. We didn't need all of that. We could talk, go on and on and on. So, but unfortunately, I, I basically have to uh, end the session now. And uh, I, I would like to do that. First of all, with thanking all of you. Um, on uh, on the panel, and I would also like to invite everybody who is interested in discussing this and other issues a bit further to the Slack channel, to the town hall meeting later on. Uh, there will also be a, a, a talk that your story is giving about industry and research and industrial relevance, so this was my advertisement session. And of course, many, many more opportunities for exchange at this conferences and at future SPLC. It's really great to be in this community, to be all, with all of you. Thank you once again for the, everybody on the panel, in the audience. Thank you very much. Okay. And have thank, a you, nice day and thank you, Thank you. Thank you.